Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by BlackRifleCoffee.com. Oh, the- oh, welcome to Drinking Bros. Robert oh. Patrick is on the show today. When you clapped your hands like that, all the lights in my dealership went on and off and on. <laughs> you still got those plugged in. Yeah. You still got the clappers. Clap on. Clap yeah, off, yeah. It's a pleasure to have you guys here. Welcome to beautiful Santa Clarita, California. Gorgeous. Uh, look, we've been to a few Harley, Harley dealerships. I was just saying, this is one of, one one of, of the nicest, nicest Thank ones you I've very been much. in. I you, appreciate that. You've we've, really we've, got a decoration style. Yeah, well, yeah, well, well you know, I give, uh, I give the credit to all my guys, Danny Vartanian, my general manager, uh, uh, Jesse Mancillas, marketing, Kennedy. Uh, we, we've, we've been working really hard on this place. When we bought it, there was an existing dealership here. And uh, we, we put a lot of, lot of sweat equity into this to spruce it up for the citizens of Santa Clarita, California. Yeah, it's, it's hard to get a, a Harley dealership, a franchise, right? It's not easy. No. Yeah, uh, yeah I get one of my best friends from college. His dad owns two. That was his lifelong dream was to yeah. own a Harley dealership. But I think he said his process was something close to like 14 years. Well, I mean. Because you he had to get vetted and somebody had to. I don't know what, exactly what the vetting process is, but I, I do know that it's been a dream of mine for for as long as I can remember. Uh, uh, it wasn't so that long ago, though, and, and you can you could speak to this much better than me, but Harley's had a waiting list just to get one. Yeah. Like in the oh, late yeah. 90s. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the, the 70s, the, uh, the 80s and the 90s was probably the big uh, years where it, you did have to wait for a Harley. You had to wait. You yeah. couldn't. You couldn't just walk in. Yeah, and, and, and now and the business one. has evolved uh, where it's, uh, you know, we've we've got the best bikes we've ever been building, and uh, uh, you don't have to wait. Yeah, exactly. So come on down. When did your love of motorcycles begin? Because look, to own a own your own dealership, that's that's saying, hey, this is a lifestyle. This is my lifestyle. Yeah, uh, I when I was in high school, uh, junior high, elementary school, mini bikes, dirt bikes, that kind of thing. A little bit. Never owned one myself, but friends. Um, I think when I was 19, 20 some odd, I got a Yamaha Midnight Special because it looked like a Harley and it was cheap. Yeah. It was black with gold trim. And I started riding that around and uh, back in Ohio. And uh, then we're, I, we're at in Ohio. Uh, I, I was living in, outside of Cleveland for a while, Westlake, Ohio. Uh, and... Uh, uh, that that was the first bike I bought, but I I always wanted a Harley, and I did a movie after Terminator Two where I I rode a Harley, yeah, and it was right then that I I I went out and bought a used Harley. That's awesome. So that was 1991 or 92. Yeah, when I bought that Harley. It was the first one. I didn't buy my first brand new Harley uh, until a couple of years later, and I bought it from Oliver Shoku, who's my business partner in this. He's the owner of Glendale Harley Davidson. Really, which is. The home of the love ride, which became the, the charitable uh, thing that I got involved with, with my riding. And uh, he sold me my first bike. A 94 Fat Boy that looked just like the one Arnold rode in Terminator 2. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, so. Speaking of Arnold, obviously, th- that had to have been your, your breakthrough as Terminator 2. Biggest thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, biggest, uh, biggest movie. Uh, that character has given me my entire career. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm almost, uh, I'm definitely in my 30th year of, uh, acting and, uh, probably about 32, 33 years by now. Um, it broke everything wide open for me and I'm still, I'm still riding that wave. When you yeah. got that, did you know that it was like, did they tell you a lot of information or was it kind of like a, Hey, we think, you know, you, you read for a role. Like, did you know that it was an Arnold picture? Did you know anything about it? Well, I got a call from my agent saying, um, "You got to go to, you got to go meet uh, on uh, Terminator 2. They're looking for an intense presence. That's all we can tell you." So I went, and I was, you know, wearing black jeans, a black T-shirt, and a black motorcycle jacket. It's pretty much the way I bombed around Hollywood at the time. I was living in a dive apartment with my uh, my girlfriend and uh, we had just gotten engaged and uh, I went to this thing and uh, the my look kind of caught Mally Finn I did some uh, some eye work with her when she turned around and she kind of said whatever you're doing now I like that 
I went and worked with a guy named Steve Quayle. I just did this whole improvisational ad lib audition where I tried to be sense aware and I slowed everything down. Uh, I looked to the, uh, the, 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 the predators and started thinking, what's a predator look like? And just what's an intense, you know, and just went for it. And they recorded it. And uh, James Cameron watched it that night. And uh, the next day I got a call saying they want you to come back and do some more. They really responded to it. Wow. Um, wh- wh- I was just following my instincts. Sure. But I knew I was on to something because I, <laughs> I, I, I just, you know, it's like one of those things where synchronicity, where the universe was aligned just right. Everything was perfect. And right. I, my instincts were right. And I just kept going with it. Uh, uh, it's neat to think back on that now, that I was that fearless to, uh, to kind of go creatively because it was, it was unique. And essentially everything you see that I did in the movie was what I did at that audition. Yeah, because usually really? at an audition, you kind of get afraid to take big choices like that. Yeah. Um, but it's also what separates you from everybody else. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you, you've got to be bold and make moves like that. I mean, again, I was, you know, that was totally just off my gut reaction to what they had sent. Not having read the script. Once I read it, yeah. then I went full bore with it. And once I really started discussing with James Cameron when he was in the room and he was filming me, then we went crazy. I started thinking about American Indians, what it would be like to be sense aware, how you would be, and, and just slowing everything down and the way you would look around and, 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 and just be as little presence as possible, but as intense as possible. It's, 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 it's a neat thing to think about. It, 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 we actually discussed the, uh, you know, it's a, it, the AI, the T-1000, the artificial intelligence. Where would they go for programming for something like that? To the natural order. A hunter. To the natural yeah. world, right? right? Where would you go? Who, is, who are the best hunters in nature? Mountain Wol- lions. Wolves. Yeah. Wolves. Uh, cats. Eagles. You know, and how do they, and so that's what we used, and we said that would be what would be the software for this artificial intelligence. It's kind of cool. Yeah, that's really oh, cool. Super cool. Well, yeah, where does it go from there? Now you you get the script, you get on you get on production. Yeah, you, you, well. Uh, Were you intimidated the, the, at all with, with I, Arnold? I wasn't and... intimidated until I read the script. Because at this point, all I knew was they were, they, they were, they were looking for something they knew uh what they 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 were looking for something specific but i didn't know how big the role was going to be yeah then you realize you're in the whole fucking movie. and so then then it's like then it's like that gulp moment where you're walking up and the the bases are loaded and you got two outs and it's a three two count bottom of the ninth yeah <laughs> and the pressure you all of a sudden you and it's how you're going to do with the pressure so I had to do, I read the script, and I, I couldn't believe it when I read it. I, it, was, it took me like five hours to read it. I, I kept visualizing, holy shit, I'm the fucking T-1000. I'm, that's the, I'm the bad guy. <laughs> oh, my God. How the fuck did I get here? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is unbelievable. So it's one of those moments where you kind of, you have to buff yourself, you know, buff yourself up to, I am worthy. Because you start to think like, oh, God, I'm not worthy of this. I can't, I can't do this. Self-doubt starts creeping in, all that kind of stuff, those fears. So I had, to, I had to get over that. It took me a while. And I walked into Cameron's office. I walked into James Cameron's office. Yeah. And uh, I popped the script down on his desk, and I said, I can do this. And he took his glasses off, and he looked up at me, and he goes, that's why you're here. Really? That's how it went down. Because he's an intense dude himself. He's intense. I, I, you know, I, I, I have to admit the entire time I did the movie, there was a certain amount of pressure that I felt. There was a couple times that I went to him, even after I'd gotten it, and I'd worked my ass off and I trained for four months for it uh, with this Uzi Gaul, this uh, special Israeli Special Force Commando. And even though I had trained like a, you know, an athlete, and was in superior condition, the best I'd ever been in. I still wasn't quite sure what I was doing was enough. You know what I mean? Sure. You're relying on a lot of things that aren't there. There was a lot of uh, special effects that, that I, I had to visualize and conceptualize. And but there were other 
pieces that you added to it that became so iconic, like to this day, I think the most iconic run ever is your run. Right. Like that, that's the oh, only yeah. anything in America that you could say, run well, like the T-1000, and that's what they do. And I'm sure that came from you. It came from me, but I stole it from, I think it was uh, Ben Foster was the sprinter at the time. I mean, I went and looked at sprinters and how do they move and how do they like run. Where nothing and, is know, affecting him. Yeah, and, you and you know, so the whole theory behind the T-1000 is, is, is constant movement forward. So if you go back and look at the film, everything from the body posture to the way I moved to the way I started walking, it was never a side to side. It was a constant forward motion. The straightest distance between two points is a straight line. You know, that that kind of a theory. So everything was, how do I project my image going forward, relentless? I'm going to, I'm going to, so when you look at sprinters, sprinters are looking at something down there, and they're focused on that, and they haul ass after it. So it's the same thing I did with the the, 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 uh, the mini bike. Yeah. It's like, I, I put a little piece of, you know, tape on the back of everything that I was chasing wherever they would have the cameras it'd always be a piece of tape that I was running at and then you would add in like I'm going to try not to blink right which I'm is hard sprinting I'm going to breathe through my nose so you're just locked I'm going to clench my jaw and keep my mouth uh, uh, shut and just and make it look as if this is effortless so, and, and, and no wasted motion right so all that was in it, and that's really the performance is 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 that. No, and now that uh, you're talking about it, I'm, I'm visualizing it, especially like every time that you were going through a crowd after John, you never went side to side. Yeah, it was you were it, always it was, it was always just out of the leaning way, straight, forward, straight, yeah. straight, yeah. And you know, uh, again, I can't take all the credit for that because James and I, uh, Cameron, discussed this. I mean, it was we were a, a very collaborative. In, in the uh, uh, pulling out the performance of the T1000, it had to have it had to have things that you could plug into. The run had to be a constant run. You can't run one 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 way. You can't run one way one day and not run the same way the next day. The walk had to be consistent. Had to be the same walk every time. So that is the performance. It's not the monologues I didn't do. You know what right. I mean? It's it's that, and I think that's why it's iconic now. I, I uh, well, the strangest thing to me is when I look back at that film, I remember you. Like to me, you made that movie, and it's like all, all I think about is that straight running, turning into liquid. Like that's what I remember. But that's the most iconic scene to me. In, well, it was in just Terminator this. It, it was also like the you went to from. Arnold being the evil one previously, and now he's good, and now this just took evil to a whole new level. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah This yeah. guy doesn't give a shit. <laughs> yeah. This guy doesn't talk. And, oh, shit, this is more advanced yeah, from what yeah, we yeah. just saw. This guy, like, he, oh, this guy, oh, my God, he just walked out of fire. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, that's the jaw dropper is the, the There's another question. Like, this was one of, the, one of the first movies that really started pushing the envelope of CGI. Well, according to Steve yeah. Spaz Williams, who worked at ILM and came up with, he's the one that put me in three dimension in the computer. And they, him and uh, Mark Dupay out of Industrial Light and Magic, they put me on a, a Lazy Susan, I had on a pair of uh, brief uh, uh, swimming trunks and a skull cap. Uh, and uh, so I, I'm, I'm essentially nude. They painted a th three inch box squares all around my body and then filmed me walking and running. And that was the first motion capture in the history of film. Really? That was the invention of motion capture. Wow. So now you see these guys wearing these things with the, the little ping pong, pong balls, balls yeah. all over them and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of the same thing, but uh, that's where it was. That's where it was. Uh, um, uh, that's where they came up with it, the conception of it. What was it like working with Arnold? Was oh, he he's cool? a great guy. Yeah. Is he? Yeah. You know, everybody gave me a lot of distance uh, uh, while I was making a movie, and I wanted distance because I didn't want to really get to know anybody. And I and I had like this mental checklist, like an athlete, like you know, like sure. anybody. This is what I got to do. This is what I got to think about. This is my game plan for today. This is what I got to be. And I would stay kind of close to myself. Uh, Did you guys party afterwards at all? We partied during Christmas. We had a, a Christmas break. We had a Christmas party. And then when the movie was over, there was a big party. Uh, we were all there. What was uh, principal timeline? 
Was it six uh, months? Uh, I feel like we filmed for seven months. Wow. That's I a long like time. I feel like it was seven months. And about three or four months worth of prep that I, uh, I wrote a journal to James Cameron of what I was feeling as a T-1000. The training I did for this thing was, it was Navy SEAL-esque. I mean, it's nothing's as tough as being a Navy SEAL. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to squeeze in on their no, of uh, their not. fame, but I'm saying it was Israeli Special Forces Commando. Go, you know, I was down at the beach, soaking in the, the 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 power of the ocean, and then he would tap me on the shoulders, and I would go run for a couple of miles, and I'd be running out into the water carrying sandbags with, yeah, you know. Uh, uh, backpacks and sit-ups in the water going under, you know, just crazy stuff. The guy just beat the living hell out of me. and uh, But it all paid off. You know, four months later, I literally felt like I could kick anybody's ass. I wasn't afraid of anybody. I thought I could run through a fucking wall. And <laughs> I believed it. I was gullible enough to believe it, you know. Where did you see it opening night? Uh, James Cameron, uh, well, that op- Okay, well, the, outside of the premiere. Yeah, outside of the premiere. Opening night. Did you go? Did you sneak in? Yeah, he got me 20 tickets. I lived at uh, Hollywood Tower at Franklin and Argyle with my bride because we got married by then. And uh, I invited 20-some-odd friends. Uh, Xander Berkeley was there who played uh, uh, the Voights. Was it the Voights? Uh, John Connor's uh, step-parents. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the one that gets the milk carton. Yep. Yes. He was there. Uh, Jason Clark, a friend of mine, he was the first AD. He's a huge uh, producer now. Yeah, he's not massive. the actor, but the yep. uh, producer, Jason Clark. He was there. A bunch of other people were there that, you know, guys I'd done plays with and stuff. And we had 20 tickets. We went to the Cinerama Dome. Ah, it's the best. We, we were just there, for, yeah, the other night. We walked down from my apartment at, at, at Franklin and our guy, walked down there, I walked in, an anonymous guy. By the time the movie was over, my life had changed. Right there on the spot. Where, was everybody bombarding you for pictures and oh autographs God, and stuff? Oh, my that guy. It was that thing. And, and <laughs> but it, well, there's no... How are you getting and, pictures back then? There's no camera phones. People, no, but people, I people are slightly intimidated, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, uh, uh, it's an intense role, so they were, you know, slightly intimidated by it, you know? Well, it was such a hailed movie, too. Nobody was upset with it. And then it, it set records for years. In the yeah. Movie. yeah. It's, it's still around. I mean, this... It's this movie just keeps going on and on, and I, 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 I am so proud to have been a part of something so big. Right. Uh, it's 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 amazing, and uh, you know, really appreciative of the fans. Some of the interesting little anecdotes I'll give you since we're sitting in my Harley Davidson dealership. Yeah. Bill, Billy Idol was um, gonna be the T1000. You're kidding. I am not. Why Billy I can't Idol? See that at no, all. no. Billy that Idol be- was gonna play the part. And uh, he got in a motorcycle accident, riding a Harley Davidson. No shit. And he injured a leg where he couldn't run and be physical. And James Cameron had to cast somebody. So he had a second chance to cast the role. So he decided to try to go with an unknown. Think about it. You got no preconceived notion of this guy. You've never seen this guy in your life unless you've seen some obscure little... B movies that I did for Roger Corman. Essentially, I'm completely anonymous. Yeah. And you cast him in this role as the most evil thing. <laughs> you, you're gonna believe it. You know. You're. You, so it's not like I'm, I'm, if I throw a name out, it's not to d- disparaging. It's uh, you know I'm not Bruce Willis trying to be the T1000. It's a complete unknown guy. Yeah. Is the T1000? Oh my God! I buy that reality. I buy the movie. I, I believe it. It's a it's a, it's another reason why I think maybe that character has has such a, a indelible impression on people. Yeah, and speaking of Bruce Willis, you did Die Hard too, right? Yeah, that was a, as a matter of fact that was in the theaters when uh, James was uh, uh, thinking about casting me, and I, he he went to see what I looked like up on the big screen, and it was part of my screen test, kind of. How was how was Bruce to work with? Oh, Bruce was a sweetheart. He was a great guy. That was my first studio movie. Uh, I had done a bunch of Roger Corman films. I started in B-movies. Uh, I could do the action, even though I wasn't a real stunt guy. I could do it because I played football and baseball when I was growing up. I wasn't afraid of anything. And uh, they just put me in lead movie after lead movie after lead movie. So it really was my film school. I learned how to be an actor for Roger Corman. And uh, by the time I got to Bruce, I kind of knew what I was doing a little bit better. Right. And... Uh, 
Oh, he was fantastic to work with. Uh, he's a great guy to this day. I think he's you know just fantastic. I'd love to work with him again. Roger Corman's one of those guys who he started a lot of people, and sure. people don't know. Oh, yeah. How many people he truly started. We, D- we, didn't he give what Ron Howard his first? You're exactly right. Directing credit. Yeah. He, Ron Howard wanted to, wanted to direct, and Roger said, You can direct, but you also got to be in it, and gave him the opportunity. Wow. So. Because he was coming off of Happy Days, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Peter Bogdanovich, uh, Francis Ford Coppola, uh, Martin Scorsese. Yeah. These guys all started with Roger Corman, Jack Nicholson. Wow. Yeah, Dennis, yeah, yeah. Dennis Hopper. Well, Dennis did some movies with I think Dennis got to start somewhere else. But but uh, if you really check into the people that went through the Roger Corman Film School, and I am so lucky that I had a friend that was working for Roger Corman that told me about a, they were looking for a psychotic biker for this movie. And uh, he told me about it. I went down and, and uh, auditioned, and I got the role, and uh, just worked my ass off, man. Yeah. You what know, were some and, of the, and they cast me in another one and another one and another one. The crazy phone calls you get after after this this hits theaters. Oh, uh, Terminator Two. Yeah. People, you know, uh, this is before social media and before all that. So, you know, I don't think that many people have my phone number. No, really. That's <laughs> with you. Uh, I heard from some childhood friends. I moved around so much when I was a kid. Uh, I've lived in like six different cities. I was born in Atlanta, Boston, Dayton, Detroit, and Cleveland. All those places before I was 18. I heard from some people who were really proud of me. Some people that had wondered what had happened to me after high school. You know, I didn't amount to much. Everybody was kind of wondering where I was. Oh, they heard I was off in Hollywood trying to make it in the movie business. You know. (laughs) Some people thought for sure, well, yeah, he's probably doing porn and a lot of drugs or something. You know, I think, I think we showed him a little bit. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 I had my, uh, I, 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 I was, you know, it was cool. Yeah, because you've worked steady for a long time. I mean, you're, you're the definition of a working actor. Uh, we had Max Martini on the show. Max is fantastic. Yeah, and you just starred in uh, his movie as well, uh, Sergeant Will Gardner. And I think that was his first directorial. I think he's directing another one. Yeah. Maxie and I worked together on a unit. Yep. Uh, we rode motorcycles together. He used to be a part of my motorcycle club, the Boost Fighters Motorcycle Club. He's no longer an active member. Uh, we did a lot of USO tours together. He has a very sincere love for uh, the uh, uh, American Armed for- yep. Forces. Um, and, and so I, do you as well. You, I mean, you've done a ton of stuff. I, I have, mean, this is kind of how we all kind of connected. Yeah. Yeah, this is... Uh, I have, and, and and mine comes from my grandfather. Was a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army. He fought World War One, World War Two, Korea, and he was still active in 1963 when he died, and the Vietnam War was going. So his his grave marker looks pretty cool. Yeah, I bet. This Samuel uh, Lieutenant Colonel Samuel Patrick served this country in World War One, World War Two, Korea, and Vietnam. That's amazing. That's pretty. It's wow. pretty badass. Yeah, how do you beat that? <laughs> you don't. That's that's my grandfather. Uh, it's interesting that you bring this up because I know you served in, uh, um, when I was going to high school, it was the Vietnam War, which was a different war entirely for us as a nation because you guys are too young, but I, I watched that war on TV in black and white. And it was when the media really started to present it in a certain way that spurned that whole uh, culture that wanted to stop the war and uh, the war was bad and, and wanted to end the war and and um, there was, when I was in high school there was such a um, um, patina of stink really on the Vietnam War vet because they were portrayed to be child killers, baby killers and right. You know, they came back and people spit on them. They didn't welcome them home. That, I, that going into the service didn't look very attractive to me. You know, once I graduated high school. It sure. Wasn't, and, I, and I come from a family that uh, has dates all the way back to the Revolutionary War that has fought for this country since. And uh, I sort of feel bad about that in a way, uh, guilty that I didn't really look at the armed forces as a possible uh, career choice. Uh, but it, but it was influenced by that. And, and I, you know, now I find myself, 
through Harley Davidson, through riding across the country and going and doing Rolling Thunder uh, and riding with uh, veterans of the Vietnam War and hearing their stories uh, that I really feel such gratitude. Um, and I want to make sure they know. Because you've been doing a lot. You've done things with Patriot Guard and, and you know, you're really heavily involved in Rolling Thunder. Um, how is that going? Well, Rolling Thunder is, uh, is really where I got my education. And, and uh, my, my brothers, my Vietnam vet brothers that I, that I hold very dear to my heart, that I understand their experience. And I found out that, you know, uh, they never lost a, a, a battle. They never lost a gunfight. Never. Yeah. And they were treated with such disrespect when they came back to this country. So Rolling Thunder is my way of showing... Uh, my love and support for them, and it's uh, a lot different than the way the media portrayed it back in the 60s and 70s when I was growing up. Yeah, you know, now it's such a different time where, you know, I see people stop Jared all the time and say, hey, thank you for your service. Absolutely. I mean, and that's the way it should have been for those guys coming back from Vietnam, but it wasn't. It was not, Because of the way the media portrayed it. Well, I think so. Yeah, I, I think so too. I, I, it, was, it became a very... Uh, was, you know, it was what it was. I mean, but it was I, misplaced anger. At the end of the day, you know, why don't, why don't you treat your politicians, your elected officials, like that? They're the ones that said that sent us over there. Yeah, it's a, yeah. you know, we all know the history you're in of a how draft. we draft. Like, yeah, you got guys that didn't even these, have a choice. Like, these poor guys went over because they had to. Yeah, and you can't even show them the respect to at least thank them for their. Look, service. I didn't get a choice. I got a, I got a letter in the mail that said here report. <laughs> yeah, and now we've got an all-volunteer army. Yeah. You know, I only bring that up because it was, uh, it's m my way of kind of thinking back. Why didn't I really think about the, uh, the armed forces when I was graduating high school? I think it was really about that. That's me being reflect. you know. Uh, um, looking back on it, Looking yeah, back I, on it, I, yeah. I, let, let me ask you this, because we, we've had this discussion on the show a few times regarding the media. Was it as bad back then as it is now? Well, because you only had what three channels? Well, it just at that started, point? But, but that's when yeah. it, that's when they figured out that they had that power. Yeah, though. that control. Like, and I and I wonder because you, you know you've lived through all of it now at this point, right? Was it just as bad, or do you think today has gotten worse? Well, I think communication is so advanced now, and uh, you know I think it's all been turned completely upside down. I mean, it's just crazy how fast something happens in the world and it's everybody in the world knows it information yeah the it's way, just yeah. so amazing now it's a little terrifying yeah how do you get lost how can you get lost anymore you can't you can't get lost you know uh it, it's it's it we are so overwhelmed with the amount of information we have access to it's hard to unplug it's hard not to be influenced by somebody and what we do have to do is look at who is behind these big engines that are giving us the information, and are they editing? You the have to remind yourself that this is a bu these are businesses, too. yeah, yeah. And the way that they succeed is to get is to get you to click on them, right? Okay, so they've realized in the last year that they could pretty much do whatever they want to get you to click on them, and then if it if it's true, it's all right. If it's not true, eh, we'll say something about it later. Yeah, we won't even apologize no. for it. No, no. Uh, that's the thing that scares me as a citizen is to realize that somebody can just uh, make a claim about me, throw it out there, and I've now got to defend myself in the court of public opinion when I used to be in a justice system where you were guilty, uh, you were innocent until proven guilty, and now... You can be tried in the court of public opinion, and I'm your life can be ruined forever. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's this mob mentality that exists. But I, I wondered if it was the same back then, because, look, you see the protests, uh, you know, in, in today's world, for whatever people are protesting over. Right, right. Uh, obviously, we had the, the protests in the 60s and 70s right. uh, over the war and, and civil rights and all that stuff. Has it really changed that much, or is it just the social media aspect of it? You know, sitting back on it, looking at it, and I, I was a younger man back then. I mean, I was a young boy back then with sure. a lot of that stuff. And the 60s was a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, d a decade of a, a lot of um, protests and uh, injustice, and things got fixed through the protests and whatnot. But I wonder if the, the, 
the people that are protesting now are trying to live in the 60s by carrying but, yeah, on that tradition yeah. of, wow, protesting's cool, man. Yeah, yeah. Let's go protest, you know? That, that's what they did back in the 60s, you know, and look what, but, but they did cause ch change and effect, you know, through it. So, but I wonder if it's sort of like a carryover, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It's like, huh, all right, yeah. I, 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 yeah I, I look at it the same way too, where I look back, uh, my yeah. wife and I were watching, you know, one of those uh, CNN, like the, the year 1960s, you know, yeah. and then when we looked at it, we were like, oh shit. It almost looks like the same thing. Same that, thing now, that's, yeah. That's going on. Well, I now. mean, you and I watched the that Netflix series in the '90s. Yeah. And like when you see when you see how hard CNN was going after the Clintons when they were in the White House, it was like, wait, this is the same. Yeah, it is the same. It just, just changed it, characters. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. It's good for ratings. That's yeah. exactly. You, all all of this is good ratings. for ratings. It's yeah. good for ratings. And I'm a part of that media world. I mean, I get it, but. Uh, um. It's just amazing. I, I, I just uh, I, I just hate to see people that are innocent being uh, convicted in the court of public opinion before they even have a chance to defend themselves. Yeah, I don't think that's right. Have you ever have you guys ever sat on a jury? Uh, I've I've been involved in a few court proceedings as a bailiff, so that, and, and it's crazy. People yeah. that have never been involved in like a criminal case, like when you see how it actually is, it's eye opening. It's an interesting experience. I mean, it's it's the one thing that's in our Constitution twice that w you you get to have a, 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 a appearance in court and there's a jury of your peers. Jury duty is a, is a privilege that we have that we get to go and serve and 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 hopefully find this person innocent of what they're being uh, uh, accused know, of. Accused of. Thank yeah. you. Um, and I, I sat on a murder trial and it's astounding to go and do your part and be a part of it. It's a neat thing. I, I like jury duty. Were you famous at the time? Yes. How is that? How is that? The being... judge was excited to have the T-1000 in his court. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, and you guys, you'll appreciate funny. this. This was 2000. This is just a couple years ago. It's the la I was, he literally said to everybody, unless you're going to Afghanistan or Iraq, you have no excuse to not be on this jury if you're selected. And my hand went up. And I said, I am scheduled to go on a USO tour in a week and a half. And I was already on the... To Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah. I, and I literally said, to Afghanistan. And he just looked at me and said, we'll be done before you go. <laughs> and I went, okay. I thought, I mean, I was sort of disappointed. Like, I'm going to find... I'm, I made it to this jury. Yeah, yeah. Because usually what happens is they go, I don't want yeah, to. Yeah, you get... He's going to influence everybody. He's a, yeah. he's a celebrity. Yeah. So what happened? You, you I served? stayed on the jury. I was on it. I, I, I can. I, uh, I, I don't. Are you allowed to talk about what you did on a jury? Yeah, Absolutely. once it's over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once it's over. Was, can, yeah. Uh, this poor young guy was convicted, but he was guilty. He was guilty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, was it did, a murder? Yeah, and it was. Um, it was gang related. Oh. Did you? Did you have once seeing this process work? Did you get frustrated with some of the nonsense? Yeah. I mean, that's that's but, the biggest thing for me is going through that is like it opens your eyes of I hope I hope to God I never have to do this because there is a lot of bullshit that 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 we have put into this process. That's like, wait, I'm sorry. What? But it you is know? still. But going back to what we were talking about with uh, communication, and everything, it's still the greatest system. There's no other country in the world. Usually you're guilty. Yeah. Now prove you're not guilty. We assume you're innocent. So we're going to have to prove that you're guilty beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's a pretty unique uh, It setup. is. I'm just I, I'm frustrated with like chain of custody oh, things yeah, yeah, where yeah. it's like you yeah. have a video of the guy doing it, but yeah. we can't show it to you because we accidentally we, 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 didn't we, have it in a baggie. We didn't so, follow yeah, the yeah. protocol. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. Yeah, so yeah. you're like, wait a minute. It's tampered. <laughs> wait a minute. There's a video of the guy committing this yeah, crime, yeah. but we can't yeah. use it. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry, what? Sorry. Come again right there. <laughs> <laughs> we know the guy did it, but we have to pretend we don't yeah. because the evidence wasn't submitted properly. Yeah. <laughs> do, do that again? That's kind of bullshit. Yeah. I, 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 I hear you. Did you get $25 a day? 
I can't remember. I, they gave me something, you know. I've, I've got jury duty coming up in a week and a half. You're That's kidding. Great. I swear to God, I get to go back. You're, you seem excited about it. I think it's the coolest thing in the world. It is super <laughs> interesting. Cool. If you've ever been in, in inside a criminal yeah, case, like it's, I mean, it is it is like and I'm sure it's like a few good men. Like lawyers yeah. are fired up. They're yelling at at, at people on the stand. Like <laughs> they're getting like it is a giant act. Look, you, <laughs> you pay you pay all that money for a reason. So they got to put on a show. It's badass, man. You watch these guys, and they're super smart. These attorneys and and they're they're looping people see, in a in an examination. To get them to get them emotional, and then they hit them with a the heart. <laughs> it's, it's it's great, especially where where I live in L.A. I go downtown, and uh, uh, I get the you know the really uh, the the uh, the hardcore stuff. So it's fascinating to me. Yeah, is Human this beings another crimi- are fascinating to me. Obviously, that's why I'm an actor because I, I love to study people and try to you know uh, portray them uh, the aspects of their personality. Is this another criminal case that you're going in? Yes. Really? Yeah, That's I might. You know, now I've done it once. I guess maybe I'm the, the guy to do it again. You're we'll the see. guy. We'll see. Maybe, maybe they, they, they need maybe to they use this as out. a campaign. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's nobody not wants it, to do jury. He's not duty. using it as an excuse, and neither can you. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? My brother uh, Richard Patrick, uh, who is uh, 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 the uh, lead singer and the uh, creator of the band Filter, he used to be the guitarist for Nine Inch Nails. Uh, Wait, that's your brother? Yeah, Richard Patrick. Yeah. He just got banned in El Paso. Oh, Why? he's from El Paso. El Paso, the concert was canceled. Why? He uh, he's uh, he's very political, and he he was telling the 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 uh, the people that were uh, uh, the venue. He asked the video guy. He said, "Can we can we flip the flag upside down and show it in distress?" And I'm gonna do some stuff to distress the flag, and because uh, we're in a state of uh, uh, distress. The country's in a state of distress because of the the, the current uh, administration. That was his point of view. It was First Amendment, Amendment right. Sure. And the venue guy said, "No fucking way. Get the fuck out of here." <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they I kicked mean, him out. <laughs> and his his concert got canceled. And uh, it's interesting. But why did I bring him up? I brought him up. Oh, because he shares the view that jury duty is cool. He likes it. He likes it too. He's yeah, been on so it. So does my wife. She's done it too. Really? It's, a, it's an interesting thing. I don't know. I, I I I find it fascinating. You can stay and do your job. We need an LA or County PSA with him about oh, yeah, go to yeah, jury duty. Yeah. It's a cool thing, man. <laughs> it's your civic duty. What's the cool Kennedy? Thing? How many times have you been on? One time. Thank you. One time, but what? You said but. There's always a but. I didn't go through. I just know, like, you don't get selected. You didn't get selected. Yeah. yeah. It's the beard. Yeah. Shave the beard. You look too sketch. Way too sketchy too for sketch. a jury. My marketing guy. Yeah. Back there. <laughs> What's the coolest thing you've gotten to do from being a celebrity? You ever gone to the White House? I've taken a tour of the White House. Who was in office at uh, the time? Two years ago, uh, President Trump. That's great. I did not get to meet him. I almost got to meet him, which was interesting. Um, you know, I've campaigned for people over the years. Uh, uh, I got to go to the White House in the inauguration for Bill Clinton uh, back in the day. Uh, that was I would cool. imagine Trump has a photo of you from Terminator 2 somewhere yeah. that he hangs I out. I bet he's a I huge would like fan. I would like to think so. I would, yeah. I, <laughs> I would like to think so. I, I hope he uh, I hope he does. That'd be cool. <laughs> Do you still look at it like an honor to, to go the, to the White the, House? The T-1000 with a spray tan. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. It'd be cool. You look at it like it's an honor to go to the White House, right? Where I think whoever is the commander in the chief, yeah. uh, I think you got to show them the utmost respect. Same. I take the uh, same position that the um, the military takes. You know, whoever's the commander in chief, he's the guy. Yep. Or gal. Or gal. If that yeah. happens. You think it'll happen? Oh, pro- pro- most probably in my lifetime. That's sure. what I, I think too. And I'm I'm 60, so oh, I figure I, I got another one, 20 yeah. years. I yeah. Think, I think after this re-election, yeah, we'll see a woman go in. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I do too. It's interesting. I mean, politics is such a a big topic, and it can really uh, cause problems if you, uh, you know. Especially in Hollywood. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's uh, you know, um, I don't know why that is, to be honest with you. Why, 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 why is that such a big thing here? I don't get it either. I don't get it. I think maybe boredom. because of... Uh, <laughs> communication in the media i mean it's you know it's all 
kind of controlled out of here, I guess. Yeah. New York and Hollywood. And most of the fundraisers and all that stuff, like, yeah. you know, when I lived here, it was, uh, you could tell who was coming up and who they were grooming um, as far as these candidates go. And, uh, you know, we said in our show, I don't know, six months ago, I'd gotten, you know, I still get the emails and I'm on those those uh, mailers of like, hey, come meet Kamala Harris for, sure. for some brunch because they're essentially testing Sure. Her to see how much money she can raise and picking and all the that candidate. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. They, they you know they want a candidate that's going to have a TVQ, someone that people are going to like. Yeah, someone that looks you know uh, looks like the image of what a, a president should look like. You know, all that goes into the picking of the candidate. I would imagine, which is a shame because it should really be based on policy. Uh, you know, what what really is their platform? What are they going to do? What are their values? You know, that kind of thing. But yeah, I think there's so much of the image thing, and that probably goes back to probably started with President Kennedy, did it not? Yeah. I, I, I would think so. He was the first one that, you know, look, I wasn't alive, but as far as the media coverage goes, you were barely. No, Just no, a couple I summers. Alive, I, a couple. I'm 60, so I, uh, I remember the day he got uh, killed. Uh, I don't think I remember the day he got killed, the day he, got, the day he was buried. I was home sick from school. I watched that. I think I saw the Lee Harvey Oswald shooting too. Really? Live on TV. On live? Li- yeah. How was that? I think I was home. I seem to. If it's in my memory, I I don't know if in fact I did. It if it feels like I saw that. Because mine was uh, from from my generation was the uh, the shuttle that exploded. Oh God, the Challenger. Challenger. So I was in oh. school and they would wheeled in a TV for all of us to watch it, and then you know. You served this country. I did. I did. You volunteered. Yeah, he did. You went. Yeah. Tell me why. Uh, well, my dad was uh, in the Navy for 29 years. Uh, he retired. Well, I, I'd, I'd been in for almost 10 years by the time he retired. Uh, but, you know, we just, that was how we were growing up. His dad was in the Navy, too, and and I was fascinated with Charlie Sheen and Navy SEALs. That's cool. Yeah. Eighth, and, I mean, I, re- I remember You knew it. you wanted to be a Navy SEAL. I, I, I wanted to do something cool. Uh, he was not a Navy SEAL. Yeah, my dad. But he uh, wanted to be. Yeah, did you? Did you want to be? That's a yeah, game? yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at our, our yearbook from back in the day, I think I was in eighth grade. I said I wanted to be a SEAL at uh, Dev but Group. See, that's so cool because what I was mentioning, like in the seventies, because of the way our our guys were coming home and the way they were mistreated. By the time it was time for him to go, post nine eleven, I would imagine. You know, you, you, you were beyond that, and you were looking at duty to your country and going to serve your country because your family had done I'd, that. I had lived on base when 9-11 happened, so like... Uh, oh, you were already on base. I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't in the military, but we lived on oh, base. Oh, you lived so on base. I'm so sorry. 16. Absolutely. Yeah, so we get picked up. at They, they close the school at 11 o'clock because we're on the West Coast. Sure. At around 11 o'clock, and we hit the freeway and sat in line for... 10 hours to get on wow because they locked the base down and then when they finally started letting people back on it was full search full dogs every vehicle yeah like everything and we just sat in that car for a good 10 hours it was it was wow. gnarly and then uh i did one more year of school and then and then went over now when i was in basic training i was almost done with it and we were we were at, at the time where you're not you know, in this structured course, 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 you're kind of cleaning up the barracks and everything like that. Uh, the instructor came in and, and did the same thing, wheeled a TV in, plugged it in, and said, we're invading Iraq. Uh, get ready to go. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, I've worked with this actor, uh, uh, Jake McLaughlin. I don't know if you know him. He was in, uh, uh, boy, I can't think of the name of the movie with... Um, Tommy Lee Jones, uh, Kennedy will look that up for me. Jake McLaughlin. I did a movie with him called Safe House. Anyway, Jake. Safe up, House is a great movie. Thank you. Yeah. North, uh, North, uh, Northern California grew up, and 9-11 happened. And he he uh, left right from high school and went and enlisted in the Army and uh, was on the tip of the spear of the invasion of uh, Iraq. Now he's an actor. He's a great guy. You, sh- you should have him I, on your I would uh, love. I would love to podcast. get in touch with yeah. him. Yeah. I can set that up where you can get in touch with that him. That would be awesome. Jake's fantastic. He's, he was there at the invasion, and uh, uh, he's in Safe House with me. He's a fantastic guy. Safe and House I was love, a really good movie. I love his story. You know, he so uh, loves this country and was so inspired, like you, and wanted to you know, get in there and do his part. 
And, uh, you know, and now he's living his life. He's having a very successful acting career. He's a fantastic guy. You should really meet him. That's great. But I love hearing those stories. And then uh, to, to be given the position to utilize what celebrity I have to be a part of the USO and go and see the troops and let them see the It changes perspective. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's kind of like where we were going, where he's talking about, you know, the weirdness of the political climate in Hollywood. Well, it's like... You see some of the people with the biggest with the biggest opinions against some of the things that we do, but they've never been over there. And yeah. They don't know they don't know what it looks like right. away from the safe place that they that they get to just drive around freely, not worry about you know having their car stolen or them killed or anything like that. And it's that like, is the great. You thing went over there more than what eight times? I think we're in the double digits. Yeah, now. and and you've seen what it looks like. I've seen it from like 2000, 2006. I've seen the big build up. I'm amazed at the logistics of uh, putting together that infrastructure to go to battle. I've heard the commanders uh, talk. I've seen you guys and get your experience, what it's like on the on the ground. It's an amazing thing to see. What a privilege I have as an American citizen to go there and see and witness what a big buildup is like. And um, um, I just, the, the great thing about the USO is the fact that we can do that and then come back home and tell people about our wonderful men and women of the armed forces and the great job they're doing for us and how fantastic they are and how they need our support. And it's 1% of our population doing this for the rest of us, which is astounding. And um, I just did um, uh, Najimi Niger. I went down to AFB 101. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know. You went there with the USO? Yeah. So that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a, uh uh, special forces or special it's operations. It's total outpost. special forces, special operations base. What a unique thing! But you know, the country is kind of a shithole. You know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> yeah. they, they've got uranium, uh, so that's one of the reasons we're down there to kind of keep an eye on what's going on. But to, to meet those guys and see those guys and see what they're enduring—that's where that. Uh, you probably uh, met a couple of my buddies. I bet you I did. <laughs> Great guys. Uh, uh, they had that ambush at Tonga Tonga. Yes. That was that. Uh, uh, unit was out yeah, of Yeah, so base. we, we last May, uh, we picked up and went to Fort Bragg and did a fundraiser for those guys that were killed in that ambush. That's beautiful. When, when we're at the conclusion of this, I'll show you on my phone. I got some pictures of a memorial, and I've got a, some things I'll show you from that, uh, that trip. But to be able to do that and then come back and tell people, it's a great thing about the U.S. So it's very unique uh, United Servicemen's Organization. Uh, You're one of the few celebrities who works with a lot of, you know, veterans. Uh, you, uh, you ever met, like, Gary Sinise? Oh, Gary's a buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, Gary's a buddy. Uh, 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 he's actually kind of a role model uh, for me because... Uh, he does amazing things for our community. Selfless uh, giving that he has. I mean, he's just... He's set the bar so high at uh, uh, what he does, uh, raising money for veterans and helping and... Uh, uh, he's just an amazing guy, really, to look up to. I'm very inspired by him. Uh, great thing I got to do was fill in for him uh, at the PBS Memorial Day concert. His granddaughter was being born. I got a call. I was doing a movie in Georgia. And he said, Robert, there's only one guy I can think that could fill my shoes to do this. You're the guy. I need you to go fill in for me at the, at the Memorial Day thing. That was live on PBS. You know those yeah, things yeah, they do? Yeah, absolutely. So I got to go do that, and uh, it, it felt good that he picked me to do it. That's amazing. Yeah, he's great. And he's done a lot of work with Rolling Thunder, too, back in the early days, the protest. And this year, by the way, is the last Rolling Thunder that's happening, which is the, the, the demonstration we do at the wall for the POW right. and MIA. Why is this the last year? I think uh, everybody's just a little tired. Yeah. You know, I've been doing it for 30-some-odd years, just like my partner, Oliver Shoku, uh, had the largest single uh, fundraising event in motorcycle history, which is the Love Ride. He's raised probably $25 million, maybe $30 million in the in the 30-some-odd years that he's been doing that event. I think at a certain point, you just kind of get tired. It takes yeah. a lot to focus yeah. and to pull that off, the logistics of setting something like that up. And I, I think these guys are just... There's talk that it might be more satellite rolling thunders around the country. Which would be ex exciting. Yeah. So, but it's uh, a big event for Harley Davidson people. You know, uh, one of the reasons why I own a Harley Davidson dealership is because of uh, the freedom I get from riding this vehicle across the country 
and experiencing the country. And I can't tell you the number of Iraqi guys that I met, uh, the vets that I've met. I've met them on base, and I've said, while you're here fighting for my freedom, I want you to know when I go back to California, I'll be riding across this fucking country, and I owe it all to you. And I can't thank you enough for, for giving me and protecting my freedom to allow me to enjoy this country that way. And uh, this brand in particular, uh, to me, signifies America more than any other brand that I can think of. Well, it's, it's certainly one of the most iconic. And I would have to imagine for somebody like you who does you know, long shoots, there's nothing more relaxing than just checking out, turning off the cell phone, and then just going for a ride. Because right now, I feel like we're followed by cameras and everything else all the time. Yeah. And it's like, this is, this, owning a Harley is one of those things where you're like, man, well, you when, can really just check out of the world. And you, you can check out, you get on there, you put, your, you put your full face mask helmet on, and I'm totally anonymous. It's yeah. me in the road, yep. me and my thoughts, me and my God, you know, me, me uh, you know, and my buddies riding across this beautiful country. And no matter how many times you ride across it, and I've done it. 10 or 11 times now yeah you're still blown away by the beauty of this country you're just amazed and then the other thing when you get outside of la and new york and you get out there and you meet the people mm -hmm. you're blown away by how nice they are yeah how 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 interested they are you i can't tell you you ride in you ride in on a harley you park at a gas station everybody wants to come up and talk to you where are you from wow you're from california holy toledo you rode all the way across here on that bike, <laughs> I, one of the one of the most fun times I ever had riding. Uh, I I just done a USO tour with Tim Kennedy. Yeah, <laughs> my buddy <laughs> Tim. Tim. Tim's a good good friend. Yeah, Timmy is. Uh, I I love him, and uh, we did a we did a USO tour together. Matthew Lillard was with us, um, and and it, 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 Tim Tim's big saying was "fuck ISIS." <laughs> <laughs> Fuck ISIS. And we have a song called that. Yeah, yeah. Fuck ISIS. Gonna... So I came back. And I, I come back from this USO trip. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm riding across country with my good friend, New York Mike, who owns San Diego Harley-Davidson. And he's a Vietnam vet. We're going back for Rolling Thunder. He was a Ford Air uh, controller. He was Air Force guy, Vietnam. What's his name? Mike Shelby, New York Mike. He owns San Diego Harley. You should really meet with him. I was a Ford Air controller. Yeah. I should meet with him. You should meet him. You would love him. He's a badass. And uh, uh, we're riding across country. We're in Kansas, I believe. And he was on the phone dealing with something. And, and I, I went into this. It was like a little hardware kind of little store in there. And I, I, got some, I got some boat ID tape numbers, letters. Yeah. And on my saddlebag, on my left one, in white, I had a black bike in about, what is that, six inches? Yeah. Maybe. Size letters, it, it said, fuck. And on the other said, ISIS. <laughs> I rode all the way across the country with this thing. I had people coming up next to me. Yeah, I am barreling down the road. On this. Coming up. Yeah. <laughs> I had a cop pull me over just to say, Who, who's this crazy guy riding around with fuck ISIS on the back of his bike? Rode all the way, got to Washington, D.C. All the Harley guys were out there getting their pictures with it, and did, did, looking at that. They were having a ball with that thing. The, the more fun for me was when I rode into Vermont and saw my daughter at her liberal arts school. I rode onto campus with the fuck ISIS thing. The college students were all going like, pretty much says it all right there, sir. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much sums it up right there, buddy. That is the so, best. Yeah. yeah. That's fun stuff. Tim Kennedy. Tim great Kennedy. Guy. Oh, great Tim, guy. Yeah, yeah. You see a I couple watched days. his last fight at Sylvester Stallone's house. No oh, really? yeah, kidding. That last fight he had. I, it, was 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 Stallone watching it with you? Yeah, we, we we were cigars sitting there watching it. Yeah, we had we had him on the show right afterwards, right after he lost, and uh, that, that was tough. It, for Well, Tim. the problem was he was supposed to fight on that McGregor card, yeah, and then he'd cut all this weight, and then we're like, uh, I think the guy got injured or tested something happened. Yeah, tested positive, so they said, hey, we'll put you on the next card. Well, the pro you know the problem is trying to cut that weight twice. Uh, he said on the show, he was like, man, I, I was exhausted. He was he was. He works out. That guy is like one of the hardest working out guys I've ever seen in my life. He lives that life. Well, did you see two days ago somebody tried to break into his house? Yeah. Yeah, what was that? That was real. 
What the fuck? You fucked up. Oh, man. Could you imagine breaking into Tim Kennedy's house Why? for Christ's sakes? Well, of all the houses in the world, <laughs> you just Why broke would you into a special forces <laughs> sniper UFC, UFC yeah, I mean, house. You couldn't have picked the worst house. No. <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> That's the definition of an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> when I when I saw we need his... to give him an award. We need to find this You're dude's the identity. Yeah. He, he, he is the dumbest person in the United States. And, I want to know what happened to him. I, I don't know what Tim well, did. What do you think he did? No, I I, I know, but I, I'm yeah. sure there's. Th- you, he just said it. You picked the wrong house. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what did oh, he God. say? It was a. I, I follow his Instagram. Yeah. That's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Play, play stupid, stupid game. game. Yeah. Play stupid yeah, on a prize. photo of him with yeah. his pistol drawn and the light on the guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and he doesn't miss. No, no. Oh, he's not gonna miss. No. I mean, he miss. He Tim Kennedy was for on. Christ's sakes. He does. Was on seven special forces groups. SIF company. And, you know, Tim's a shooter. Oh, fuck, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he sent me a box of that Ranger Up gear he's got. Yeah. Ah, it's great Yeah, it's company, yeah. It's great stuff. It's yeah, great so stuff. we work with him on Range 15, and, uh, yeah, great guy. Um, he's down in Texas with you guys. He's in Austin. Yeah, he's in yeah. Austin. Yeah, yeah, he's in Austin. Yeah. Yeah. I was just down there for South by Southwest. I didn't have time to look him up, but uh, I had a movie you have a that movie was there? premiering down there. Yeah, I have a movie that's coming out. You guys will like this movie. It's, uh, it's called Tone Deaf. It is a, a movie, a generational movie, a political horror comedy dark about a baby boomer generation widower who opens up his mansion to uh, as an Airbnb to a millennial because he's never, he, he didn't go off to war. He didn't serve in Vietnam. So he's kind of got this psychotic itch where he kind of wants to know what it's like to kill somebody. <laughs> and he decides. Well, you're you're he talking to the right guy here. He might as well uh, go after one of these millennials because they <laughs> disgust him. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so this this generational thing, this baby boomer point of view and this millennial point what of view. What a dark and movie. Generation. It's pretty funny. It's uh, very dark, and uh, I won't uh, screw up the ending. But it, it was pretty well received at South by Southwest. So. Uh, I'm excited about that. I think it comes out in August. It's called uh, uh, Tone Deaf. Okay. And uh, it's myself and Amanda Crew from uh, Silicon Valley. Yeah. Uh, is is in it. Uh, Ricky Bates Jr. directed it. That's great. Yeah, it's who, neat. Awesome. who are your, who, some of your favorites that, that you've worked with throughout your career? Oh, my God. Well, you mentioned some of them. Bruce and Arnold and James Cameron. Uh, you were Harrison talking about Ford, Stallone. Stallone I've worked with twice. I love, I love Sly. Great guy. Hey. I did Copland with him. Yeah. And uh, I Copland's did, uh, one, another uh, one. What a great movie. I'm, I was so Harvey pissed Keitel. when he didn't win an Oscar, by the way. Yeah. God damn it, man. That was two years ago, and I was just like, just give it to yeah, him. Yeah, Creed. At this point, just yeah. give it to him. Well, he was really great in that movie, too. He was fantastic in it. Um, Harrison Ford. That's a buddy of yours? Wow. You I know I did. I did no, I, I did a movie with Harrison. Uh, he's a fantastic guy. I, I had a wonderful dinner with Harrison. Uh very, very cool guy. Just he and I having, having a, had a he gets nice high. Meal. He likes to smoke a lot of weed. Well, uh, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that. I got a microphone in my hand. No, no, not no worries. It, uh, it's a known uh, thing. He's a, he does what he does. Uh, he's also <laughs> a pilot. You know, he he flies and does also. He's a cool guy. Yeah. Uh, loved working. I did, I've done two movies with Clint Eastwood. Oh wow! Wow. You know, he's a big hero of mine. Yeah. And uh, one where uh, he was the director, which was Flags of Our Fathers. Yep. Based on that book. Oh, yeah. Great film. Uh, yeah. The Invasion of Iwo Jima. And the other was um, Trouble with the Curve, where I got to be his boss. <laughs> was that, uh, that the was baseball, a, baseball movie? Baseball movie. Was, uh, was it Justin Timberlake who was it, in that? It was. Yeah. And Amy Adams. Yeah. And Matthew Lillard. And Matthew Lillard. Who uh, do you know, Matthew? Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he fan- almost ended up doing one of my films, uh, maybe four or five years ago. Great guy. I mean, couldn't have been nicer. He got it was a scheduling conflict. He went out of his way to call me, and it was just a great dude all the yeah, way around. He's a sweet guy. He's a guy. One of these Hollywood guys. Where I popped into a USO. Uh, I popped into a van to go off on a shoot for uh, Trouble with the Curve. And he was sitting, uh, and he noticed the USO luggage tag on my backpack. He said, the USO? He said, what do you do with the USO? And I said, well, 
you know, I, 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 I go over when they give me a, an opportunity to see the troops. And uh, I've been here and here and here and here. And then I come back and tell everybody about how fantastic our armed forces are. I would really like to do that. And I've heard that before from people. You know, and I never hear from them again. Right. Or when they really find out what they got to do to do it. Because it's, it's not an easy thing. You got to fly for 24, 36 hours, get there, and then you're... You run around. You're not getting a lot of sleep. It's 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 a, it's a big deal. It's an investment of time. And uh, Matthew was one of the few that said, "I volunteer to go, and I want to go. Can you set me up?" And I said, "Sure." And I've done like, I don't know, seven or eight with him. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody that's done it, like like you have to want to do it because it's not it's not easy. It like, is not. You're easy. not flying. No. You're flying coach. You're, to Kuwait, yeah, and then you're getting on a military bird, and, and then it's, you're rolling yeah. in. And I mean, we did one a couple years ago. I mean, we we do 24 hours of flying, and we step out, and they're like, "You're going on in in in, in one hour." Yeah, and they're like, "Oh, yeah, all right, wow, <laughs> coffee, yeah." Anybody? Monster? <laughs> and if you haven't seen Jerry without alcohol, it's a nightmare. Oh. It's a, no, I'm kidding. Because <laughs> they don't have that over there, right? Well, I don't no, know. No. Oh, not in Kuwait. No. no. Nope. Yeah, not in Kuwait, yeah. Dry not country. Kuwait. Not in Kuwait. Um, but it's. Uh, uh, but he took me up on it. And uh, Matt, Matt and I have done quite a few. He's my road dog. He's That's awesome. He's a very great, great American. That's awesome. What do you have coming down the pipe as far as film-wise goes? I know you say you've got the film at South by Southwest. I feel like you're always doing television. I've seen you in a lot of TV. A lot of TV. Uh, first Mayans MC, I believe. I, Mayans, I, I, I just did, saw you I did the pilot. Did you, did you meet uh, our buddy Rocco? Vince he, Vargas? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Great guy. Uh, I had done Sons of Anarchy, and they asked me to come in and represent Sons of Anarchy for the Mayans pilot. That's that was awesome. the yeah. deal. Kurt uh, Sutter's become a friend you know from uh, the whole motorcycle world thing um i've got like five or six movies coming out down the pike so uh, i've been real busy i think the last one i did was in december and so far this year i've just been focused on this dealership and getting this thing up and running really well sure uh being somewhat selective over what my next move is going to be i'm not sure if i want to go back into television i just did four years on the a uh, TV show for CBS called Scorpion. It's a grind, isn't it? That TV it's schedule, that one-hour drama. Hard. Yeah, It's very, very, again, it's not digging ditches, but it is grueling in its own way. Um, and I'm just not sure what I want to do. So being a little super selective right now, I've, I've been afforded the opportunity to be a little bit more so so you see yourself working till like 88 like clint eastwood i mean that guy is still grinding out movies at 88 and 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 like clint i want to be inspired to direct a film like my buddy max martini would love to be able to go and direct a film like max has done kudos to max for uh sergeant will gardner and uh, pulling that off he you know he wrote that yeah wrote it and uh went out for financing and all that stuff because that's that's another now grind. he's on Just to, the He's got two more. I think. He's got two yeah. more going. Yeah, he's yeah. doing. He's doing really, really well. But you know, uh, my uh, Bobby Duvall. Uh, I did a movie with Bobby, and he's a big inspiration to me. Uh, he played my father in Jane Mansfield's Car. But you know, it, as far as longevity and working forever and ever and ever and doing, you know, really good work, and and uh, those guys inspire me. So yes. Uh, Joke in my family is, is you know, either, I'm either going to die on my mark or, uh, you know, be in my trailer and some poor little PA, PA is going to come knock you. on the door and find me dead. <laughs> and then, He's dead. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I served him breakfast. He was fine. He was fine and then he's dead. Oh, God. Uh, this is the point in the show where we get to the drinking bro of the week. Drinking bro. Of the week. This is somebody that has inspired you or helped you or just kind of molded you into the man or actor that you are today. Uh, is there I'm one person give, in your life? I'm going to give my drinking bro to my one of my best friends, Stephen Bridgewater, who has also been kind of a mentor to me if, I, if, if I've ever had one. He's my acting coach. And I started working with him. The first job I did with him was The Sopranos. Oh, wow. 
And it was a life-changing thing for me. Um, and he really helped me with my confidence uh, w with acting and turned my career around. And I think I would definitely say my acting coach, Stephen Bridgewater. That's awesome. Amazing. And I don't know where he – I think he's in Nashville, Tennessee right now, working with his daughter, Jessie, who has horses in Nashville. I think he's a – Stephen is – uh, he's he's still in Hollywood, but uh, you know Hollywood. It's, it's a tough place to be. So I think he's in Nashville for about a year. Yeah, but uh, he was he's been the biggest uh, uh, influence on me career wise. That's great. So if and he still drinks. If I was drinking, Stephen, if you hear this, we definitely pound down some, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I've been sober twenty three years. Have you really? Impressive. Yeah, that's impressive. That's amazing. I, I think been. he's done it for maybe 40 days. 23 so. days. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you and know, recently, I mean, recently it, it quit works for, for some and people, and I bring it up just because, uh, you know, I, I, I don't like the whole anonymity of it for myself. I mean, I am proud of it. It's a major accomplishment to be able to go 23 years without having a drink. Sure. Uh, I did it for my kids. I didn't want my kids to see me fucked up. And my daughter's birthday today, she's 22. Uh, she's never seen me fucked up, and uh, it was important to me. Uh, so uh, that was the main, that was the impetus for me giving it up. Plus, I was a terrible drunk, and uh, got arrested for it, and you know, yeah. stupid shit. Yeah, I can't drink. I, yeah. I had to admit I can't do it. Yeah, so. but there's not, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, shit, you correct. If you can, it, you yeah. can. If you can't, you can't. Yeah, exactly. You, you, did, you did the best thing you could do. Yeah, you go. So <laughs> you did. I'm very, very happy with my sobriety. But Stephen, if I was gonna have one right now, buddy, it'd be with you. <laughs> tell, <laughs> tell all the people at home uh, where your dealership is, where they can find you. Uh, well, I hope everybody that's listening to this thing hasn't been too bored with this podcast. No, you're. I, I hope I'm. I hope I'm keeping you entertained. You're. You're one of the most this fascinating awesome. dudes on the planet. Yeah. I appreciate it. You're yeah. very, being very kind. My my dealership is. Uh, it's the new Harley Davidson dealership of Santa Clarita, California, which is approximately thirty miles from my house in the Hollywood Hills. It's just north of Los Angeles. It's right off the fourteen, uh, and the five. Uh, I give you the address. What is it? Two one one six zero Center Point Parkway. Yeah, and there's uh, there's a Drinking Bros special for Harley's. Out yeah, twenty percent right? yeah. off Drinking Bros <laughs> promo code <laughs> on every bike. Kidding, yeah, kidding. yeah, we're gonna have some cool stuff up here. We're gonna have a a, a T-shirt that's gonna be exclusive to this dealership only. Uh, we want it. We're thinking about bringing back the Love Ride. Uh, we've done the Love Ride for the USO before. We've done the Love Ride for Wounded Warriors. Uh, we might do some stuff with Gary Sinise up here. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get Gary uh, over here with Lieutenant Dan Ban. I, you know, this might be the first he's hearing of it right here. Uh, <laughs> but we're going we're gonna, to, you know, we really want to, um, uh, this community is uh, adventure-minded and power sports. Uh, they have power sports tendencies. There's a lot of testosterone up in this community in Santa Clarita. Uh, so uh, we're excited to uh, really give them the dealership that they deserve. So we're in the works right now of making it uh, as beautiful as we can for them and a place that they're going to want to come hang out and, and buy a Harley Davidson, the best motorcycle in the world. Uh, you can come in here and get some free coffee and take a free test ride. Um, I love it. Uh, I, I love the fact that I'm in business with Harley Davidson uh, to be, have the opportunity to sell freedom, which is what America is. Absolutely. You know, I'm, after, I, I'm, I'm basically selling America. Yeah. So uh, I'm super proud that I'm in the uh, to have Oliver Shoku invite me to be his partner and be here. And when we have the love ride. Uh, when we ever do get it back here, I'd love to have the Drinking Bros here. Anytime you guys want to use this place to do a podcast, you want to bring in another guest from outside, seriously. I'd be fantastic. When yeah, you're absolutely. in L.A., if, you, if you're looking for a location and you don't have to interview me every time, you can bring somebody in, bring Max Martini in, whoever you yeah, want. Yeah, this there. would be a great spot for we would love oh, this. We would love to extend our... Uh, invitation to you thank to, you, hey, to thank come you. Be this here. was awesome thank you so much and drinking bros come on out uh two one 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 no two one one three zero center point parkway there it is Santa they got Carita, it California. they got it what's the zip code 
Nine. Nine. <laughs> Nine one three five zero. There you go. There, there we is. go. Come on down. Come on down. Uh, Robert Patrick, w- one of the finest actors. Uh, oh yeah. We have. You're so what, what a wonderful. And just a cool, you're just a cool motherfucker. <laughs> yes. Appreciate just that, a cool guys. Motherfucker, oh. Hey, man. hey, gunny time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm going out to Cayman, Arizona to shoot two more episodes of Gunny Time. You, you know that oh, show? Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Remember that show R. Lee Armory did? Yeah. yeah. For Glock. Yeah. 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 I'm going out to Kingman, Arizona. Oh. I'm gonna be shooting. I'm going to ride my that, Harley out there. going to be shooting Glocks. That's perfect. Oh, that's awesome. It, Come on out. Have you guys ever been to the Big the big Sandy? No, I've never been. Have you? I've doing, I'm going to be shooting some stuff that I they had to see my passport to let me shoot this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be there with Randy Couture. Oh, beautiful. Oh, Rand, yeah. Randy was in Range 15 as well, yeah. Adam Baldwin. Yeah. From Full Metal Jacket and myself. We're going to be out there shooting Gunny Time episodes. That's, oh, that's awesome. awesome. We did it last year. We got, them, we got them running up here on the TVs up here, but uh, <laughs> super excited about that. That's amazing. Oh. Robert, thank you again, man. God bless you guys. What a pleasure. Yeah, really amazing, pleasure. Robert. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you.